this in probably on Wednesday of next week as a preview. Mm -hmm. And it'll be, I would say, probably three minutes of this, con you know, okay. three minutes of the conversation yeah. spliced together a little bit, but again, the full version. And then if I do end up cutting it for our Sunday show, um, the fullest unedited version we put on YouTube so folks can see the whole thing. Okay. That way they can know, hey, did he just edit something out? You know, they, right. no, go look at the whole thing. Oh, sure. Right. Sure. For yourselves. So, uh, and we tell our viewers that. <clears throat> uh, okay. <laughs> Bless you. Here. Bless you. <laughs> um, all right. Three, two, one. And joining us now are candidates Greg Johnson and Tom Mertens. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. Uh, we want to start really just um, before we get into the, the nitty gritty of things, I want to just learn a little bit about you. Um, so Greg, I'm going to start with you since you're kind of on my left here. Sure. Um, tell me about yourself, just what you want voters to know, but also um, if you can share a little bit about how that has influenced your decision to be here today. Sure. Um, so my name is Greg Johnson, I'm running here for the 72nd District, which is soon to be a vacant, vacant seat. I'm a lifelong resident of Rock Island County. Lived here my whole life. I'm 58 years old. This is, uh, I ran for office in 2018. Uh, I'm not a political, uh, longtime political candidate by any means, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm running the economy that I grew up in, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, was really humming here. We had a manufacturing base, things, uh, the Rock Island that I grew up in had nearly 60,000 people. And what I've seen over the last few decades is things have really changed here. We, we've, we've, seen, uh, we've seen a lot of loss. We really have had a hard time redefining ourselves. And uh, you know, I, I have kids and grandkids. I, I have an 11-year-old daughter at home. And at this point, I'm just really committed to uh, just creating a better world for her and her friends. Um, I, you know, I've, I have been a longtime uh, canvasser. I've, I've, I've worked for a lot of candidates to try to make change here in this area and, and try to, to bring positive results. And the, the one regret I really get from parents is, is that you know, uh, opportunities have left the area, particularly on the education side. We failed to fund education for decades, and a lot of uh, kids go to school out of state. They seek those opportunities elsewhere, and what happens is if they go to school out of state, they end up building their lives away from here. And I just really want to uh, create opportunities for our kids here to allow them to build their lives here. You know, um, I said earlier, I have an 11-year-old daughter, and I, you know, when she leaves to go to school, I hope she stays right here. But if she does leave and build a life somewhere else, I want it to be because she made that decision, not because we didn't work hard to, to create those opportunities right here in the Quad Cities, because I think our people are second to none. We have a very special, special work ethic here. And, and why not build your life right here in the Quad Cities? Tom, tell us about yourself. Uh, sure, my name is Tom Martins. I'm 54 years old, and I have lived in uh, Rock Island County all my life, too. Uh, and I do agree with Greg that uh, things were much better back in the you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and we lost a lot of big manufacturing around here. And one thing we can do to bring it back is we got too many business regulations, and our property taxes are driving those businesses and people out of Illinois. And that's one of the reasons why I'm running is to fix things like that. We also have... Uh, election issues that happened in 2020 that I want to fix. And so uh, I decided to run to make things better in Illinois because I know it can be. We just got to get the right environment to make that happen. Tom, I know um, you work a full-time job, but you obviously still have to engage with uh, the voters uh, in the 72nd district. Can you tell us what you're hearing as far as the things they're concerned about, the things they would want um, the person that they're voting for to be focused on? Um, number one. Number two, how do you kind of bring in your own priorities? Um, I want to get a sense of that. And I want to get a sense of what are the specific things you would do if you're elected day one, month one, to drive towards those things? Sure. Uh, the people that I've been talking to did not like what happened in 2020 as far as the shutdowns because of the, the COVID uh, situation that went on. They didn't think it was right that a governor had the unilateral authority to just say, 
you have to get a shot, you have to stay home, your businesses has to close, things like that. They want to have more freedom to make choices for themselves. That's one of the biggest things that I've heard is they want freedom. Uh, also, they don't like the property taxes, like I mentioned before. Uh, are, they're going up every year, and we're not seeing the results of those property taxes. Uh, our streets aren't really the greatest uh, in District 72, and that's one of the things that property taxes are supposed to fix, but it all seems to be going to uh, other things rather than what it's really supposed to. Uh, other things that people want, uh, they, they want election integrity. They want to make sure that, you know, People that can vote are supposed to vote. They want to make sure that every vote is counted and make sure they're legal votes. And so that's, that's really what I'm trying, trying to do for District 72 and Illinois is to make that happen. And how would you do that um, day one, month one? Uh, well, uh, first we need to lower our property taxes. We can't compete with other states, and that's why businesses are leaving. We also have gas taxes that are uh, twice the size of the national average, and we've got to lower that too, because again, we just can't compete with other states. And so everyone drives to Iowa, if you're right here next to the river, of course, to get cheaper gas. Well, that's no tax money for Illinois then, right? And so uh, we need to uh, get uh, voter ID installed. You need an ID to get registered to vote. I don't see what the big deal is about getting an ID to vote. So we can make that happen. Uh, paper ballots would be good. We did that for 100 years or so with paper ballots, and it worked just fine, and we had less fraud. Now that we have all these computers that can manipulate the votes, uh, it changes things. And those, those drop boxes are another bad thing, too, because they're not monitored. And you know anybody can throw any kind of mail-in vote on there, whether it was you or not. Uh, there's just so many things to fix in Illinois, and that's what I'm here to do. Greg, what are you hearing out there, and what would your priorities be, and again, how would you go about addressing those? So, the things I'm hearing at the door, I alluded to earlier, are you know, me making sure that we provide our kids with a, a solid education. For decades, we didn't fund education. We had an evidence-based funding that came in play into 2017. We need to continue to make those investments. Also, infrastructure. You know, uh, since Governor Rauner, his assault on organized labor and, and workers a few years ago, We've had six credit rating upgrades. The state has uh, invested in infra infrastructure. We do need to continue to work on getting our roads and bridges fixed here because if you want to bring business in and you want people to invest in your community, you have to have the best roads and bridges. Uh, those are the things we're hearing about, opportunities. But the other thing we are hearing about is Democrats in particular are really tired of, of, certain, of candidates living in the past. This is 2022, uh, the 2020 election. Donald Trump lost that 2020 election. Uh, dozens and dozens of, of lawsuits have proven that, have upheld those decisions. And, and voters, I think, you know, they're, they're struggling right now to pay their bills and to live day by day. And when they hear uh, candidates talking about how you know, Donald Trump was cheated out of this election and continuing to throw out these conspiracy theories, I think it sows a lot of dis discord and, and I think it really amps up the temperature and really causes problems with it within any democracy when you're trying to delegitimize an election. We need to move. I just really believe we have to move things forward and not continue to live in the past. And I think that's why the Quad City Times endorsed me. They made that reference, that we need someone who's forward-looking, not someone who continues to, to look past it to the 2020 election. I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the systems of government that we have. Um, you both um, have talked about um, the idea of either uh, fair government um, or kind of leadership roles and, and, and political maps, election maps. Um, you guys both make references to that. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and what that looks like? From a leadership position? You know, when I go to your website, you talk about fair government. What does mm -hmm. that mean? Fair government means a government, number one, we do have a history here in Illinois of corruption on both sides of the aisle. You know, I, I worked 30, over 30 years in, in Illinois government, and I saw department heads go to prison. I saw governors go to prison, both Republican and Democrat. Fair government is someone who's in this to serve the people of their district, not to serve themselves. Uh, you know, when, when uh, government, when people get elected, and they, they, they go to serve themselves, then the people, the, their constituents are, are really getting the short, the short side of the stick. And um, that to me is fair government, is taking that 
and, and holding, uh, giving the authorities uh, the power they need to address these issues. Because until we properly address corruption in Springfield, then we're going to have people from both sides of the party that are going to continue to take advantage of it. And when that happens, we all lose. Um, Tom, same question, because your website, maybe I don't know if it uses the phrase fair government, but you do talk about uh, the power that the leadership roles in the House and Senate have, um, as well as the political maps. Can you right. talk about what, what that means to you? Well, sure. Uh, Greg is right. There's been so much corruption in Illinois, and one of the biggest things we need to do to fix that is let the Inspector General release his findings without having the, needing the permission of the legislature to do that, because that's why you don't ever see anything happen, because he, can, he or she can do all the work that they want to do, but if the legislature says, no, you can't put it out, it dies. And so he can't give it to any law enforcement, he can't get it out to the news. If we, we could free him up to do that, things will change. Uh, oh, jeez. Um, that's one of the, that's, that's more of the, the fair and transparent things we could do to make Illinois better. Uh, we don't live in a democracy, though. We live in a representative republic or a constitutional republic, and that's one thing that I hear all the time. And we vote democratically, yes, but we don't have a de democratic form of government. So that's just one thing I want to get out there to make sure everyone understands that. Uh, what was the second part of that question? Uh, it's it, about your, the leadership roles and uh, the political maps and how they're drawn. Oh, well, uh, we know that the political maps uh, in 2020 uh, were gerrymandered. Uh, unfortunately, it, it hindered a lot of Republicans. They had to run against each other, and so we lost uh, a, lot, a lot of places you know, to represent Illinois. They cut towns up, and uh, Governor Pritzker said he wasn't going to do it, and he did do it. And so uh, we need to fix that, so that way, if that ever happens again, we can fix it uh, and make sure that the, the maps are fair and by, by a third party, because you shouldn't cut a, a city in half just to make you know, your, your candidate uh, get to have a better chance to win. Can you talk a little bit, Tom, about, um, you know, this is, there's no incumbent here for this particular uh, seat. Is if you were to win, is are you going to take things in a totally different direction, or will you be building on what's already been built? I know that's a little bit of an obvious question when we, you know, kind of focus on political parties, but I would just want to get a sense of how the voters are going to experience um, potentially your representation if you were to win. Sure, it probably would be a quite a different direction since no Republican has held this seat the entire time it's been in existence. So it would be a totally different uh, direction, uh, more conservative, you know, get government out of your face and, you know, leave people alone. That's, you know, the basic philosophy of conservative stuff is small government, as long as you're not harming anybody else or messing with anybody else, we'll leave you alone. And so, uh, you know, I do want to listen to anybody who has concerns and try to make an app, and if it benefits all of District 72 in Illinois, of course. Uh, but we need to, like I mentioned earlier, is get government out of our hair, which is less taxes, uh, you know, they, they can get rid of the grocery tax just in time for election, but then bring it back after. Why can't we just get rid of the grocery tax altogether? Uh, I've mentioned before, property taxes. You know, that only hurts the poorest of us the most. Uh, they raised our, sta our state taxes back in 2010. It was supposed to fix the budget, fix the pension. It did nothing. It should probably go back to 3%, and it should be a, a flat tax like that because that gives everyone skin in the game because a lot of people don't want to raise taxes on themselves and that's the way it should be. Greg, same question. Uh, will it be similar? Will it be very different? It, 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 a little of both. So in, in, uh, when Bruce Rauner was defeated and left office, we had about a $15 uh, billion dollar deficit. We had about a 12 month backlog of bills and doing business in Illinois was, was difficult. It's hard to find business partners. It's hard to find vendors. Uh, four years later, we've, you know, what we find is, is we're now at about less than a week backlog of bills. The deficit has shrunk dramatically. And, and we, are, we are in much, uh, we've had six credit rating upgrades. So we're in a much better place uh, than we were four years ago. We've done that by, by actually budgeting government smartly. And, and investing in the things you're supposed to invest in. You know, we, the investment in infrastructure with the Capitol Bill that many Republican, Republicans supported, including Senator Neil Anderson here locally, 
you know, we, uh, it, it brought in, you know, you get $7 for each dollar. You know, when they attach a value to taxpayer dollars, the return on investment on infrastructure is $7 to every dollar because um, it, it, it is what brings business in. It's what brings people into your community. Also, going back to shortly after that, we got the evidence-based funding passed where we started to invest in education after decades of, of neglect. We do have to drop property taxes, and we can drop property taxes by sending someone to Springfield that's going to be in those rooms and bring a bigger piece of that pie back here to our school districts. Our school districts are way too reliant on, on property tax. Um, some some uh, districts are doing better than others. So, you know, my plan, I, I want to go there and fight for our school districts back here in the 72nd. You know, I'm running for state legislator, but I'm also uh, more, you know, if you'll notice on my sign that says you're a representative, I'm representing the 72nd district. My job is to go there and fight for the 72nd district and bring every single penny I come back here to, to help out our citizens here in, here in this community. Can we uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about the Safety Act? It's very controversial. Um, it's a big piece of legislation that um, some of it's already in effect, some of it's going to be in effect. Um, can you help us understand where you stand on that? Is And, and would you do anything to, to change that direction or keep it there? No, there's a lot. There are changes that have to come to the Safety Act. I spent 32 years working in the Illinois Department of Corrections. I, I participated in this criminal justice system. I saw the good and I saw the bad. I saw a system that, that, that we do, you know, we do need some, some changes within the system. The Safety Act was set up to, to really do, do two things, to uh, create pretrial fairness and to keep our community, our communities and our police officers safe. And right now, uh, I think the body cameras, I think that's a good element of it. I, I think the, the current cash bail system that we have is, 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 is not fair because, or, it, and it certainly doesn't serve the, the need of keeping us safe because the reality is under our current system, you can, uh, you have, you'll be posted, you will post bail or bond uh, with the act that you've committed, you know, whether it's a domestic or more, whether you've perpetrated violence, you can actually buy your freedom. If you're poor, obviously you cannot. So there, that's a, there's an unfairness right in that. But you're not protecting the community. Under the Fairness Act, uh, the judge decides who gets, judges decide who gets released, who doesn't get released. And uh, the important thing is that we make sure we provide law enforcement and our state attorney's office with the resources to make sure that they can prove to a judge why this individual's uh, dangerous and why they shouldn't be back out there on the streets. But we, there's a lot of work to do on the Safety Act, a lot. You know, I'm, I'm also someone who not only served 30 years in the, uh, in the DOC, but I'm also someone who's been on the side of negotiating tables for a long time. We have to get all of the stakeholders in there. We have to get uh, the communities that are impacted by the highest rates of crime. We have to get our police officer unions. We have to get everybody at the table and try to come up with a solution to, to, to just what we're dealing with because you know, we also have to also acknowledge the fact that we have a criminal justice system in which uh, the minority population is well around 70%, but only makes up about 30% of the population outside of the Department of Corrections. So we need to look at this from all angles, but we'll get there. I really believe we can get there. Tom, do you see things the same way? Uh, not exactly. I do agree with the body cameras. Uh, that helps the police and it helps the individuals who are committing crimes. Uh, we do need to get rid of it. Uh, I don't think, I don't, I don't agree with Greg that just because you're poor, you should get out, have a get out of jail free card. Uh, bail is one of the first things that people should be thinking about if they commit a crime. And uh, that's just one of the first deterrents versus the sentence you get for committing the crime. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of things in this bill that encumbers the police to do way, way, way more paperwork and make them not out on the street because they're doing things with paperwork than out there fighting crime. And this is just another attempt to deflate the law enforcement community and make it, make it look that they're the bad guys and we have to protect the criminals. So we need to get rid of the, the Safety Act altogether and we can definitely fund to get uh, body cameras at the same time. Okay, wrapping up here, Tom. Um, what did I miss that I didn't ask about but that you want voters to know about? Make sure you vote no on Amendment 1. They say it's for workers' rights, but they already hold us hostage with their rights every time there's a contract negotiation. 
This would put uh, uh, any uh, labor, state labor worker, whenever there's a negotiation, it would be put in the Constitution as a right to negotiate, that, and it would also ban the right to work. It has property tax increases in it, and it also gives the uh, union bosses even more power to make anything happen, and that's just some of the more major things that it does. So vote no on Amendment 1. And Greg, what do we miss? Well, you know, I'm just going to call out the dishonesty of what he just said. If, you, if Every voter can read every page of the Workers' Rights Amendment. Not one line talks about a property tax increase. It's an Illinois Policy Institute talking point, the same one they used on the fair tax, you know, a couple years ago. It's, it's just very dishonest. You know, if people want to organize, they should have the right to organize and collectively bargain. Unions built the middle class. You look at, or you look at where we're at right now in this country, around 7% in the private sector we have workers organized and we have a, a smaller middle class than we've ever had. And the gap between those at the top and those at the bottom continue to grow. So, you know, really, if, if you want to see the middle class continue to grow and thrive, you need to support this workers' right amendment and not fall for all of the, uh, the lies and, and the, uh, the dishonest tactics being, uh, being uh, perpetrated by the other side of this, really. Vote right. yes on Amendment 1. All right, Greg Johnson, Tom Martins, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you very much. Absolutely. It was nice yeah, meeting you. It's our pleasure. You. So Shelby's okay. She was just off a couple of days. Or... Yeah, she was, uh, she's in, where did she go? She went to Oregon. Okay. I think. Oh, yeah. she's from out west. She's from out that way, right? She's actually from South Dakota. Yeah, South, yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah. Wow. So, a little vacation. Yeah, absolutely. Well deserved, but it yeah. comes at a busy time, but we need her back, you know, November 8th to help us, you know, do the coverage. Tom, very nice seeing you again. See you. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. It was, a, I Thanks. think, a, a nice conversation. And, and anyone. Whoa, I got my mic on here. Oh, yeah, because it's attached to the chair there. Yeah, it's on my chair. You guys do a little different here.